In Prague we are to change trains again. We say goodbye to Latsy. Magda gives him our old address, Kosheth Leosh Utsa number 6. He promises to keep in touch. There's time before the next departure, time to stretch our legs, sit in the sun and the quiet to eat our bread. I want to find a park. I want to see green growth, flowers. I close my eyes every few steps and take in the smells of a city, the streets and sidewalks and civilian bustle. Bakeries, car exhaust, perfume. It's hard to believe that all of this existed while we were in our hell. I gaze in shop windows. It doesn't matter that I am penniless. It will matter, of course. In Koshitsa food won't be given out for free. But at this moment I feel completely full just seeing that there are dresses and stockings to buy, jewelry, pipes, stationery. Life and commerce go on. A woman fingers the weight of a summer dress. A man admires a necklace. Things aren't important, but beauty is. Here is a city full of people who have not lost the capacity to imagine, make, and admire beautiful things. I will be a resident again, a resident of somewhere. I will run errands and buy gifts. I will stand in line at the post office. I will eat bread that I have baked. I will wear fine couture in honor of my father. I will go to the opera in honor of my mother, of how she would sit at the edge of her chair listening to Wagner, how she would weep. I will go to the symphony. And for Clara, I'll seek out every performance of Mendelssohn's violin concerto. That longing and wistfulness. The urgency as the line climbs and then the rippling cadenza, the crashing, rising chords. And then the more sinister theme in the strings, threatening the solo violin's rising dreams. Standing on the sidewalk, I've closed my eyes so I can hear the echo of my sister's violin. Magda startles me. Wake up, Ditsu. And when I open my eyes, right here in the thick of the city, near the entrance to the park, there's a concert poster advertising a performance with a solo violinist. The picture on the poster is my sister's. There on the paper my Clary sits, holding her violin. Chapter 8 In Through a Window We step off the train in Košice. Our hometown is no longer in Hungary. It is part of Czechoslovakia again. We blink into the June sun. We have no money for a taxi, no money for anything, no idea if our family's old apartment is occupied, no idea how we will find a way to live. But we are home. We are ready to search for Clara. Clara, who gave a concert in Prague only weeks ago. Clara who, somewhere, is alive. We walk through Mesky Park toward the center of town. People sit at outdoor tables, on benches. Children gather around the fountains. There's the clock where we watch the boys gather to meet Magda. There's the balcony of our father's shop, the gold medals blazing from the railing. He's here. I am so certain of it that I smell his tobacco, feel his mustache on my cheek but the windows of the shop are dark. We walk toward our apartment and here on the sidewalk near the place where the wagon parked before it carried us to the brick factory, a miracle occurs. Clara materializes, walking out the front door. Her hair is braided and coiled like our mother's. She carries her violin. When she sees me, she drops the violin case on the sidewalk and runs to me. She's moaning. Ditsuka, Ditsuka, she cries. She picks me up like a baby, her arms a cradle. Don't hug us. Magda shrieks. We're covered in bugs and sores. I think what she means is, dear sister, we're scarred. She means, 
Don't let what we've seen hurt you. Don't make it worse. Don't ask us what happened. Don't vanish into thin air. Clara rocks me and rocks me. This is my little one, she calls to a passing stranger. From this moment on she becomes my mother. She has already seen in our faces that the position is empty and must be filled. It has been at least a year and a half since we have seen her. She is on her way to the radio station to give a concert. We are desperate not to have her out of sight, out of touch. Stay, stay, we beg. But she is already late. If I don't play, we don't eat, she says. Hurry, follow me inside. Maybe it is a blessing that there is no time to talk now. We wouldn't know how to begin. Though it must shock Clara to see us so physically ravaged, maybe that is a blessing too. There is something concrete Clara can do to express her love and relief, to point us in the direction of healing. It will take more than rest. Perhaps we will never recover. But there is something she can do right now. She brings us inside and strips off our dirty clothes. She helps us stretch out on the white sheets in the bed where our parents used to sleep. She rubs calamine lotion into the rash that covers our bodies. The rash that makes us itch and itch, that passes instantly from our bodies to hers so she can barely play her concert for the burning all over her skin. Our reunion is physical. Magda and I spend at least a week in bed, naked, bodies doused in calamine. Clara doesn't ask us questions. She doesn't ask us where our mother and father are. She talks so that we don't have to. She talks so that she doesn't have to hear. Everything she tells us is phrased like a miracle. And it is miraculous. Here we are together. We are the lucky ones. There are few reunions like ours. Our aunt and uncle, our mother's siblings, were thrown off a bridge and drowned in the Danube, Clara tells us, blunt, matter of fact, but when the last remaining Jews in Hungary were rounded up, she escaped detection. She lived in her professor's house, disguised as a Gentile. One day my professor said, you have to learn the Bible tomorrow, you are going to start teaching it, you are going to live in a nunnery. It seemed like the best way to keep me hidden. The convent was nearly 200 miles from Budapest. I wore a habit. But one day a girl from the academy recognized me, and I snuck away on a train back to Budapest. Sometime in the summer, she got a letter from our parents. It was the letter they had written while we were in the brick factory, telling Clara where we were imprisoned, that we were together, safe that we thought we would be transferred to a work camp called Breadfield. I remember seeing my mother drop the letter onto the street during our evacuation from the brick factory, since there was no way to mail it. At the time I thought she had dropped it in resignation. But listening to Clara tell her story of survival, I see things differently. In releasing the letter, my mother wasn't relinquishing hope, she was kindling it. Either way, whether she dropped the letter in defeat or in hope, she took a risk. The letter pointed a finger at my sister, a blonde-haired Jew hiding in Budapest. It gave her address. While we trundled in the dark toward Auschwitz, someone, a stranger, held that letter in his hand. He could have opened it, he could have turned Clara into the Nilash. He could have thrown the letter away in the trash, or left it in the street. But this stranger put a stamp on it and mailed it to Clara in Budapest. This is as unbelievable to me as my sister's reappearance, it's a magic trick, evidence of a lifeline that runs between us, evidence, too, that kindness still existed in the world even then. Through the dirt kicked up by three thousand pairs of feet, many of them headed straight for a chimney in Poland, our mother's letter flew. A blonde-haired girl set her violin down to rip open the seal. Clara 
Sarah tells another story with a happy ending. With the knowledge that we'd been evacuated to the brick factory, that we expected any day to get shipped away, to Breadfield or who knows where, she went to the German consulate in Budapest to demand to be sent to wherever we were. At the consulate, the doorman told her, little girl, go away. Don't come in here. She wasn't going to be told no. She tried to sneak back in the building. The doorman saw her and beat her up, punching her shoulders, her arms, her stomach, her face. Get out of here, he said again. He beat me up and saved my life, she tells us. Near the end of the war when the Russians surrounded Budapest, the Nazis became even more determined to rid the city of Jews. We had to carry identification cards with our name, religion, picture. They were checking these cards all the time on the streets, and if they saw you were a Jew they might kill you. I did not want to carry my card, but I was afraid I would need something to prove who I was after the war. So I decided to give mine to a girlfriend to keep for me. She lived across the harbor, so I had to cross the bridge to get there, and when I got to the bridge the soldiers were checking identification. They said, please show me who you are. I said I had nothing, and somehow, I don't know how, they let me go across. My blonde hair and blue eyes must have convinced them. I never went back to my friend's house to retrieve the card. When you can't go in through a door, go in through a window, our mother used to say. There is no door for survival. Or recovery either. It's all windows. Latches you can't reach easily, panes too small, spaces where a body shouldn't fit. But you can't stand where you are. You must find a way. After the German surrender, while Magda and I were recovering in Wells, Clara went to a consulate again, this time the Russian consulate, because Budapest had been liberated from Nazi control by the Red Army, and tried to learn what had become of us. They had no information about our family, but in exchange for a free concert, they offered to help her get home to Koshitsa. When I played, 200 Russians attended, and then I was brought home on top of a train. They watched over me when we stopped and slept. When she opened the door to our old apartment, everything was in disarray, our furniture and possessions looted. The rooms had been used as a stable and the floors were covered in horse manure. While we were learning to eat, walk, write our names in wells, Clara began playing concerts for money and scrubbing the floors. And now we've come. When our rashes are healed, we take turns leaving the apartment. There is only one good pair of shoes among the three of us. When it's my turn to wear the shoes, I walk slowly on the sidewalk, back and forth, still too weak to go far. A neighbor recognizes me. I am surprised to see you made it, he says. You were always such a skinny little kid. I could feel triumph. Against all odds, a happy ending. But I feel guilt. Why me? Why did I make it? There is no explanation. It's a fluke. Or a mistake. People can be sorted two ways, survived. Didn't. The latter are not here to tell their tale. The portrait of our mother's mother still hangs on the wall. Her dark hair is parted down the middle and pulled back in a tight bun. A few curly strands feather across her smooth forehead. She doesn't smile in the picture, but her eyes are more sincere than severe. She watches us, knowing and no nonsense. Magda talks to her portrait as our mother used to do. Sometimes she asks for help. Sometimes she mutters and rants. Those Nazi bastards. The fucking Nilash. The piano that lived against the wall under her portrait is gone. The piano was so present in our daily lives that it was almost invisible, like breath. 
Now its absence dominates the room. Magda rages at the empty space. With the piano gone, something in her is missing too. A piece of her identity. An outlet for her self-expression. In its absence, she finds anger. Vibrant, full-voiced, willful. I admire her for it. My anger turns inward and congeals in my lungs. Magda grows stronger as the days pass, but I am still weak. My upper back continues to ache, making it difficult to walk, and my chest is heavy with congestion. I rarely leave the house. Even if I weren't sick, there is nowhere I want to go. When death is the answer to every question, why go walking? Why talk when any interaction with the living serves to prove that you move through the world in the company of an ever-growing congregation of ghosts? Why miss anyone in particular when everyone has so many to mourn? I rely on my sisters, Clara, my devoted nurse, Magda, my source of news, my connection to the greater world. One day she comes home breathless. The piano, she says. I found it. It's in the coffee house. Our piano. We've got to get it back. The coffee house owner won't believe that it's ours. Clara and Magda take turns pleading. They describe the family chamber music concerts in our parlor, how Clara's cellist friend, another child prodigy from the conservatory, played a concert with Clara in our house the year of his professional debut. None of their words hold sway. Finally, Magda seeks out the piano tuner. He comes with her to the cafe and talks to the owner and then looks inside the piano lid to read the serial number. Yes, he says, nodding, this is the elephant piano. He gets together a crew of men to bring it back to our apartment. Is there something inside me that can verify my identity? that can restore myself to myself? If such a thing existed, who would I seek out to lift the lid, read the code? One day a package arrives from Aunt Matilda. Valentine Avenue, the Bronx, the return address reads. She sends T, Crisco. We have never seen Crisco before and so have no idea that it's a butter substitute to be used for cooking and baking. We eat it plain, we spread it on bread. We reuse the tea bags again and again. How many cups can we brew with the same leaves? Occasionally, our doorbell rings, and I jolt up in bed. These are the best moments. Someone is waiting outside the door, and in the seconds before we open it, that person could be anyone. Sometimes I imagine it is our father. He survived the first selection after all. He found a way to work, to appear young throughout the rest of the war, and here he is, smoking a cigarette, holding a piece of chalk, a long measuring tape slung around his neck like a scarf. Sometimes it is Eric. I imagine on the stoop. He holds a bouquet of roses. My father never comes. That is how we know for sure that he is dead. One day Lester Corda, one of the two brothers who rode with us on the train from Wells to Vienna, rings the bell. He has come to see how we are making out. Call me Chi-Chi, he says. He is like fresh air rushing into our stale rooms. We are in an ongoing limbo, my sisters and I, between looking back and moving on. So much of our energy is used just to restore things, our health, our belongings, what we can of life before loss and imprisonment. Chi-Chi's warmth and interest in our welfare remind me that there is more to live for than that. Clara is in the other room, practicing violin. Chi-Chi's eyes light up when he hears the music. May I meet the musician, he asks, and Clara obliges. She plays a Hungarian chardosh. Chi-Chi dances. Maybe it is time to build our lives, not back to what they were, but anew. 
Throughout the summer of 1945, Chi-Chi becomes a regular visitor. When Clara has to travel to Prague for another concert, Chi-Chi offers to go with her. Shall I bake a wedding cake now? Magda asks. Stop it, Clara says. He has a girlfriend. He's just being polite. Are you sure you're not falling in love? I ask. He remembers our parents, she says, and I remember his. When I have been home a few weeks, although I am barely strong enough, I make the journey on foot to Eric's old apartment. No one from his family has returned. The apartment is empty. I vow to go back as often as I can. The pain of staying away is greater than the disappointment of vigilance. To mourn him is to mourn more than a person. In the camps I could long for his physical presence and hold on to the promise of our future. If I survive today, tomorrow I will be free. The irony of freedom is that it is harder to find hope and purpose. Now I must come to terms with the fact that anyone I marry won't know my parents. If I ever have children, they won't know their grandparents. It isn't just my own loss that hurts. It's the way it ripples out into the future. The way it perpetuates. My mother used to tell me to look for a man with a wide forehead because that means he's intelligent. Watch how he uses his handkerchief, she would say. Make sure he always carries a clean one. Make sure his shoes are polished. She won't be at my wedding. She won't ever know who I become, whom I choose. Clara is my mother now. She does it out of love and a natural competence. She also does it out of guilt. She wasn't there to protect us at Auschwitz. She will protect us now. She does all the cooking. She feeds me with a spoon, like I'm a baby. I love her, I love her attention, I love being held and made to feel safe. But it is suffocating too. Her kindness leaves me no breathing room. And she seems to need something from me in return. Not gratitude or appreciation. Something deeper. I can feel that she relies on me for her own sense of purpose. For her reason for being. In taking care of me, she finds the reason why she was spared. My role is to be healthy enough to stay alive yet helpless enough to need her. That is my reason for having survived. By the end of June, my back still isn't healed. There is a constant crunching piercing feeling between my shoulder blades. And my chest still hurts, even to breathe. Then I break out in a fever. Clara takes me to the hospital. She insists that I be given a private room, the very best care. I worry about the expense, but she says she will just play more concerts, she will find a way to cover it. When the doctor comes in to examine me, I recognize him. He's the older brother of my former schoolmate. His name is Gabby. I remember that his sister called him the Angel Gabriel. She is dead now, I learn. She died at Auschwitz. He asks me if I ever saw her there. I wish I had a last image for him to remember her by, and I consider lying, telling him a story in which I witnessed her do something brave speak of him lovingly. But I don't lie. I would rather face the unknown void of my father and Eric's last minutes than to be told something that, however comforting, isn't true. The angel Gabriel gives me my first medical attention since liberation. He diagnoses me with typhoid fever, pneumonia, pleurisy, a broken back. He makes a removable cast for me that covers my whole torso. I place it on the bed at night so that I can climb inside it, my plaster shell. Gabby's visits become more than just physically therapeutic. He doesn't charge me for his medical care. We sit and reminisce. 
I can't grieve with my sisters, not explicitly. It's too raw, too present. And to grieve with them seems like a defilement of the miracle of our togetherness. We never hold one another and cry. But with Gabby, I can allow myself to grieve. One day I asked Gabby about Eric. He remembers him but doesn't know what became of him. Gabby has colleagues working at a repatriation center in the Tatra Mountains. He says he will ask them to see what they can learn about Eric. One afternoon Gabby examines my back. He waits until I am lying down on my stomach to tell me what he has learned. Eric was sent to Auschwitz, he says. He died in January. The day before liberation. I erupt in a wail. I think my chest will break. The blast of sorrow is so severe that tears won't come, only a jagged moaning in my throat. I am not yet capable of clear thoughts or questions about my beloved's last days, about his suffering, about the state of his mind and his spirit when his body gave out. I am consumed by the grief and injustice of losing him. If he could have held on for a few more hours, maybe even just a few more breaths, we could be together now. I moan into the table until my voice goes hoarse. As the shock dissolves, I understand that in a strange way the pain of knowing is merciful. I have no such certainty about my own father's death. To know for sure that Eric is gone is like receiving a diagnosis after a long ache. I can pinpoint the reason for the hurt. I can clarify what has to heal. But a diagnosis is not a cure. I don't know what to do with Eric's voice now, the remembered syllables, the hope. By the end of July my fever is gone, but Gabby still isn't satisfied with my progress. My lungs, compressed too long by my broken back, are full of fluid. He worries that I might have contracted tuberculosis and recommends that I go to a TB hospital in the Tatra Mountains, near the repatriation center where he learned of Eric's death. Clara will accompany me on the train to the nearest village in the mountains. Magda will stay at the apartment. After the effort of reclaiming it, on the off chance of an unexpected visitor, we can't risk leaving it empty, even for a day. Clara tends me on the journey as if I am a child. Look at my little one, she exclaims to fellow passengers. I beam at them like a precocious toddler. I practically look like one. My hair has fallen out again from the typhoid and is just starting to grow back, baby soft. Clara helps me cover my head with a scarf. As we gain elevation, the dry alpine air feels clean in my chest, but it's still hard to breathe. There is a constant sludge in my lungs. It's as though all the tears I can't allow myself to shed on the outside are draining into a pool inside. I can't ignore the grief, but I can't seem to expel it either. Clara is due back in Koshitsa for another radio performance, her concerts are our only source of income and can't accompany me to the TB hospital where I am to stay until I am well, but she refuses to let me go alone. We ask around at the repatriation center to see if anyone knows of someone going to the hospital, and I'm told that a young man staying in the nearby hotel is also going there to be treated. When I approach him in the lobby of the hotel, he is kissing a girl. Meet me at the train, he growls. When I approach him on the train platform he is still kissing the girl. He is gray-haired, at least ten years older than I am. I will turn eighteen in September, but with my skinny limbs and flat chest and bald head I look more like twelve. I stand beside them awkwardly as they embrace, not sure how to get his attention. I'm annoyed. This is the man to whom I'm to be entrusted? Could you help me? Sir? I finally ask. You are supposed to escort me to the hospital. I'm busy, he says. He barely breaks his kiss to respond to me. 
He is like an older sibling shaking away an annoying sister. Meet me on the train. After Clara's constant fawning and attention, his dismissiveness cuts. I don't know why it bothers me so much. Is it that his girlfriend is alive while my boyfriend is dead? Or is it that I am already so diminished that without another person's attention or approval I feel I am in danger of disappearing entirely? He buys me a sandwich on the train and a newspaper for himself. We don't talk, other than to exchange names and formalities. Bela is his name. To me he is just a rude person on a train, a person I must grudgingly ask for help, a person who only grudgingly gives it. When we arrive at the station, we learn we have to walk to the TB hospital, and now there is no newspaper to distract him. What did you do before the war? he asks. I notice what I didn't hear before, he speaks with a stutter. When I tell him that I was a gymnast and I danced ballet, he says, that reminds me of a joke. I look at him expectantly, ready for a dose of Hungarian humor, ready for the relief I felt at Auschwitz when Magda and I hosted the boob contest with our bunkmates, the lift of laughter in terrible times. There was a bird, he says, and the bird was about to die. A cow came and warmed him up a little, from his rear end, if you know what I mean, and the bird started to perk up. Then a truck came and finished off the bird. A wise old horse came by and saw the dead bird on the road. The horse said, didn't I tell you if you have shit on your head, don't dance? Bela laughs at his own joke. But I feel insulted. He means to be funny, but I think he is trying to tell me, you have shit on your head. I think he means, you're a real mess. I think he's saying, you shouldn't call yourself a dancer if you look like this. For a moment, before his insult, it had been such a relief to have his attention, such a relief to be asked who I was before the war. Such a relief to acknowledge the me who existed, who thrived, before the war. His joke reinforces how irreparably the war has changed and damaged me. It hurts for a stranger to cut me down. It hurts because he's right. I am a mess. Still, I won't let an insensitive man or his Hungarian sarcasm get the last word. I will show him that the buoyant dancer still lives in me, no matter how short my hair is, how thin my face, how thick the grief in my chest. I bound ahead of him and do the splits in the middle of the road. Please support me with a like and a subscription. Thank you.